Okay, class, I uh, just wanted to start this um, uh, lecture with uh, the, a piece about planarian regeneration because I forgot to mention it in class, and then we're going to go on and talk about the parasites. Um, so I'm not going to say much other than to say that planarians have these really powerful abilities to regenerate themselves. You can see these little... Um, fun with cutting up planarian experiments. Um, anyway, if you make the first cut here and then do a longitudinal cut to here, you can have it grow two heads. Um, if you cut here and here and discard either end, um, you can get it to grow two heads this way. Um, if you make the longitudinal cut first um, and then cut the head off after some growth period, you get this little weird looking thing over here. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> the point is that they do have um, uh, really amazing abilities to regenerate, which is uh, the, the nature of their cells. And um, a lot of people have been sort of looking at those regenerative uh, properties uh, for, for all kinds of applications. Okay, so on to the um, cestodes, which are the tapeworms. And um, you might recall that uh, tapeworms actually um, exemplify all of those things that we had talked about that we consider uh, adaptations towards a parasitic existence. And certainly they have um, really increased reproductive capacity, which is a, which is a major adaptation. Um, they, they produce, as we'll talk about, um, millions of eggs within their lifetime. And um, many of the other parasitic worms produce a lot of eggs. So the idea of um, the fact that you have to sort of spread your eggs or offspring out into uh, an unpredictable environment means that only some of them are probably going to make it. You know, the idea of getting from one host to another is actually a pretty challenging thing. So a lot of these um, eggs end up in an environment and get killed or eaten and never hatch into a tapeworm. And so this kind of reproduction um, we call R selection. You might remember that little R um, in our selection from the logistic growth equation from your ecology class. Uh, and if you don't, you might want to look that up because um, the idea of maximizing reproductive rate, putting out a lot of offspring, most of them are going to uh, not survive, only a few will make it, <clears throat> is a re, uh, reproductive strategy that certain organisms exhibit and certainly parasites are probably at the top of that list. Um, they also exhibit uh, simplification of digestive structure, and, and in fact, they exhibit um, the complete loss of digestive tract. Unlike the trematodes that still have a little bit, these guys have absolutely um, no mouth or digestive tract at all. And so they have to have lots of surface area uh, for, for food or um, <clears throat> digested food uh, materials that they're swimming in or living in uh, to be able to be transported across their body surface. So they have to get their food just transported right in across the tegument as they don't have a mouth to do any ingestion. And when you're living right in the intestine, swimming right in the digested food, it's certainly available and there's a lot of surface area across which these uh, materials can just be uh, transported into the organism so it can use it for its own growth. Okay, they definitely don't have any kind of sense organs and they don't have any brain. This so-called head area isn't really a true head in that sense of the word because there, there is no um, concentration of ganglia. There is no anterior end where there is a, a brain of any sort. So it's not technically a head. Um, <clears throat> and so therefore we don't technically even have an anterior and a posterior. We kind of have sort of a beginning and an end. And sometimes it gets called a head, but this is pretty much inaccurate. And what this um, scolex is then is just a place um, where hooks and suckers <clears throat> are there so that they can attach to the intestinal wall of a host so that they don't get moved out of the body with the peristaltic contractions of the digestive system. All right, so they have a scolex, and then they produce all these little body sections here that are called proglottids. You can see the word proglottid over here. Each one of these sections, even starting at the beginning and as you go along the tapeworm, um, each one of these sections has repetition of primarily just reproductive system. These are basically just reproductive machines. 
Each proglottid produces um, <clears throat> or contains testes and ovary and other aspects of the female and male reproductive systems. And um, as you see, the immature proglottids are produced at the <clears throat> right behind the scolex, or what's called the neck region. Again, it's not really a neck. I'm going to move on to some of the other pictures here. Um, it's not really a neck because there isn't really a head, right? Because there isn't really cephalization. <laughs> but we kind of use those terms in an analogous sense. You know, from the neck region, each of these little tiny proglottids um, are produced, and they start to make new ones. So they keep making new ones from this area. So any of the old ones just keep getting moved along as new ones are produced. Okay, so they kind of move down along the worm. They're not actually moving, but as new ones are produced, they get shifted down towards the end, other end of the worm. And you can see that these proglottids are getting bigger and bigger and bigger along the length of this worm. So each proglottid is maturing over time. And what's happening is the reproductive organi organs are maturing. And then finally, um, towards the end of the worm, the eggs within the uterus have become fertilized and basically each little proglottid here is like a bag of fertilized eggs that um, is going to break off. So these pieces are going to break off, end up in the feces, and end up in the external environment. So these um, critters are uh, amazing in their capacity to reproduce. Um, each proglottid can produce like 50,000 eggs. And each worm can have like two to 4,000 proglottids. <laughs> so that's enormous. And these things can be up to like 12 meters long. So that's like 30 to 40 feet um, within the body of a person. If a tapeworm gets that big, you can just imagine the medical problems associated with intestinal blockage and, and all, all manner of symptoms uh, associated with that. Um, so um, my next picture, <laughs> it's kind of funny, it, it, I, you, you find these things on the internet. This is um, from the Dr. Uh, oh, actually, I'm going to show you these two. I'll come back to those. Um, this is from the Dr. Oz show, and there's Oprah holding a tapeworm. I'm not sure why she's smiling, because it is kind of a, a creepy thing. Again, it gives you a sense of how big, how long these worms could be. And probably, actually, most of this worm uh, is still in this jar here. So. Um, they, they can get really huge. <clears throat> this slide shows um, this picture on the left. You can see the scolix. You can see immature proglottids. Again, they're much smaller at the neck region and starting to get bigger. And then some uh, more mature proglottids. Over on the right here, same thing. You can see the scolex with its uh, suckers and hooks, the holdfast organs, immature proglottids. And even um, in this part of the photograph, they're still pretty immature. You can see each proglottid, each section here is still fairly small. And then some getting larger here and the development of um, reproductive structures going on inside. So as they're making more and more proglottids, they're growing in pieces. Um, <clears throat> again, this is called strobilization. Right, that sort of idea of growing in pieces, just like we saw the strobola in the Aurelia life cycle, where they were producing lots of those little ephrodisks, and, and, and it's um, a, a form of asexual reproduction in that sense. Okay, so this sometimes an immature worm is called a strobola. All right, so these guys are definitely monoecious. Each um, proglottid contains both. Um, testes and ovary and again inside the proglottid is basically just reproductive structure there's no other kinds of systems here and there there may be some nerve or sensory cells but not a, not a whole lot there's no certainly any digestive tract at all uh, very little musculature very little anything else other than reproductive systems so we have a uterus we have ovary, we have testes, we have um, a genital atrium or opening. Um, and so these, when these worms are sexually mature, the, the mature proglottid end of the worms can wrap around each other. And the um, um, serous, which is kind of another name for penis, 
um, can be inserted into the vagina of another worm. And these guys also, also actually self-fertilize fairly frequently. Um, it's certainly a strategy you can use if you don't have another worm. If there are two worms, then they'll cross-fertilize. Um, if there's only one, then they'll self-fertilize. So again, they're producing, um, you know, over their lifetime, you know, if each proglottid produces 50,000 eggs <laughs> over their lifetime, a worm of a huge size can produce literally millions of eggs. And, and that's just about the pinnacle of, of our selection <laughs> there that you can go. So, so um, on the left is a mature proglottid. On the right is what's called a gravid proglottid. Um, once the eggs become fertilized, they grow within the uterus. The uterus expands and is just full of um, fertilized eggs that are ready to develop into larvae. And again, each proglottid will break off and basically a bag of eggs ends up in the environment. Let me back up a slide because I just wanted to show you some close-up pictures of the stomachs. <laughs> Sorry about my dog in the background. Okay, so um, you can see definitely on these um, pictures the hooks and the suckers really up close. And the fact that different species have um, different kinds of scolices, which is the plural of scolex. Okay. Um, this uh, diagram here shows the life cycle of um, the beef tapeworm, which is Tenia. And the, um, uh, in the, um, in the um, beef tapeworm, the definitive host here is the human, which ends up with the disease. Um, and the intermediate host here is the cow, okay? And if we start on this end where there, let's say we have a human that has a tapeworm growing in their body, a gravid proglottid breaks off and passes um, into the feces. This um, ends up into the environment. And of course the proglottid itself breaks open and the, um, the fertilized eggs are developed into zygotes that end up with a, a kind of a hard outer covering, um, which allows it to deal with harsh environmental conditions. Again, you're out in the environment, you have to have certain kinds of adaptations to prevent uh, just um, drying out, um, if nothing else, or withstanding cold temperatures and such. And so, these structures are called oncospheres once they develop this covering. And the oncospheres often do, uh, end up on um, grass, um, maybe in untreated water, depending on what part of the world that you're in, um, what, what kind of the sanitation conditions are like. Um, if an oncosphere ends up on some grass where there are cows that are living, the cow may eat the grass and swallow the oncosphere and then what happens is it um, goes from the intestine and migrates through blood vessels in the intestine into the circulatory system and then finds its way into muscle tissue in the cow. Okay, and then the oncosphere will um, hatch into what's called a cystocircus, which is basically embedded then in the <clears throat> muscle tissue of the cow. And if the cow is butchered for food um, and the steak or whatnot is not really cooked very thoroughly, then the cystocircus can still be alive. And if a person eats the steak, um, then they're ingesting a cystocircus, which will grow into <clears throat> the adult worm um, in the intestine. It'll pass down through the stomach into the intestine, attached to the intestine and then start to grow its little proglottids in your body. So it all sounds pretty gross. Um, the, um, certainly the incidence of tapeworm within the United States is not nearly what it was long ago. Um, most of the, the beef you know, in this country is inspected by the USDA. There are all kinds of um, uh, sanitary and health laws, um, water treatment, as you know. And certainly that's not necessarily true for most of the rest of the world. We sometimes forget that we live in a country that's in the minority with respect to being able to just take for granted that um, your food is gonna be free of these kinds of organisms. So uh, tapeworms are definitely still quite um, 
abundant in different parts of the world for, for humans and certainly for other animals. So this is the beef tapeworm. There's also a dog tapeworm. Um, so there are other species of tapeworms. Uh, Tenia is the genus here. And uh, we have Diplidium in lab, which is the dog tapeworm. Okay.